our um, center, our guest speaker today is going to continue contemplating that context. Um, and so let me introduce him. Um, there are a few names in the world that one must know if they have an interest in um, internationalization and related topics. And one of them um, high on that list is certainly that of, that of our keynote speaker today. Um, Hans De Witt has written many of the books and articles about internationalization, including a co-authored book titled The Globalization of Internationalization, a co-authored book titled Internationalization of Higher Education, and uh, solo, I believe, Local and Global Internationalization. He's the founding editor of the Journal of Studies in International Education and a founding member and past president of the European Association for International Education. He has received many prestigious awards for his contributions and has been named leading provocateur in higher education, uh, primarily for his co-authored article titled The End of Internationalization. His work as a researcher, professor, um, and currently director of the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College, informs the internationalization process of universities everywhere. We are very honored to have him here today, so uh, please let's welcome our guest speaker, Professor Hans Dewey. Thank you, Estella. Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a real uh, great uh, pleasure to, uh, to be here. And also to congratulate the university not only for its really comprehensive internationalization strategy, but also for the community of practice. Uh, because you can have a comprehensive internationalization strategy uh, defined by the president and uh, actively implemented and coordinated and stimulated by uh, the five proposed. Uh, but you need to have really the key stakeholders in the university be part of the comprehensive internationalization strategy. So you need to have the administrators, you need to have the students, but in particular you need to have the faculty to really make internationalization work. And that's why it's so important that internationalization is not a top-down uh, approach, but really is a comprehensive approach in which all the actors are very uh, actively involved and engaged, and in particular take ownership of the internationalization process, because then only it can really actively work as well. I will try to say in my presentation today. Uh, I will do that in the context of the changing political climate. Uh, as being a European and having a wife and two children who are French nationals, of course, I yesterday was very much engaged in what happened in France and pretty relieved, I must say, with the results. Uh, but at the same time, there's also a big concern because still it is that very substantial part of the French population, like also in countries like the Netherlands, uh, not so much, unfortunately, not in Germany, but in particular also in the United States, have an increasingly much more anti international, anti global, anti immigration, uh, anti the need for climate change, anti poverty, and all those aspects uh, approach uh, to society. And that creates all kinds of chances, needs, but also opportunities for us how to deal with this kind of uh, uh, new developments which are challenges, something like we have taken too long for complacency to be uh, natural, that we are international and international is good in itself and there's nobody who should be worried about. So I will try to address that today and give you some idea about my views about what internationalization means, uh, what does it mean particularly the focus on an internationalization of home context and what are the challenges that we face. Before doing that, I need to say something about the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College, which I direct since to, uh, September 2015. Uh, and not only because I'm proud to be its director and it's a great center, but also because I think the center in itself is a very clear example of what internationalization means in practice when you are leading the center like Center for International Higher Education. It was founded uh, 22 uh, years ago by Professor Philip Alba, and several of you know a renowned scholar in international higher education. And as I said, I brought up uh, in September 
September 2015 as the, the director. And it is a very small centre, but we do a lot of things. And uh, I just give you some examples of how we do it and what we do. Uh, our main publication and known for is International Higher Education, which is uh, a journal which appears four times a year. And to give an example how international it is, it is not only translated in six different languages, it is available not only in English, but it also in French, in Portuguese, in Spanish, in Chinese, in Vietnamese, uh, and in Russian. And it's done in cooperation with partners from, that we have all over the world. Uh, but also, it is international because all the orders are coming from all over the world. And so you get a perspective not from the American side, or in my case, the European side, uh, but you get really a perspective on higher education developments from all over the world. And uh, you can subscribe free online uh, to the journal because we also think it's very important that many more people possible have access to uh, that journal. Uh, we also uh, do many research projects, and all those research projects are not that we in our centre do the research, but we always incorporate scholars from different parts of the world in our studies. <coughs> so if we have, like we just published a book on different shaping systems of higher education around the world, that we have orders from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America, from Central Asia, Europe, Middle East, participating in that kind of research. That's in our view, a much better way than trying to say, we know what is happening in the world, uh, but we have only a limited kind of knowledge. We do that in our graduate studies, we have a, a doctoral studies program, and uh, Leslie is a proud uh, graduate from our uh, doctoral program at the Center for International Higher Education, uh, but we also have, since uh, last year, a Master of International Higher Education. And again, not only in composition of students, we try to be international, but also in the teaching. So we do a lot of online teaching, uh, in which we invite professors from different parts of the world to give guest lectures online to our students, uh, to co-supervise uh, uh, students in their thesis and their field experience. And in this way, we really give an international experience. And that's a very different approach than what we see in many European and American higher education programs, which really give much more uh, perspective of that's the way, the way it has to be done is the American way or the European way, and we try as much as possible to try to afford that. We do that in our uh, other publications, in our books, uh, we do that in, uh, in our resources that we have. We have uh, a lot of visiting scholars coming to the center every year uh, from all over the world. We have research fellows from, uh, from different parts of the world. And also, we do it in our partnerships, uh, which we have with different uh, partners. These are some of our main partners, uh, also working together as a group of centers in higher education studies international. And you see that we have a partner in every part of the world. In, uh, in Latin America, it is with the uh, Center for Policy Studies and Education of the Pontificia Institute in Chile. We have in South, uh, South Africa with the Rosalind Natal University. Uh, we have it in China with Hong Kong University. We have it in Russia with the High School of Economics and in Europe uh, with uh, the Catholic University uh, of the Sacred Heart in Milan. And in this way, again, we can collaborate much more on all kinds of activities, not only research but also on publications and on uh, professional development. Uh, programs and in our teaching. And so we have our master program that we do all kind of research and for instance one of the researches that we uh, currently are doing is a study on uh, what does it mean when you are a university like in this case a Catholic University, Boston College is a Catholic Jesuit uh, institution uh, and there are many Catholic uh, universities around the world. What does internationalization mean when you are a Catholic university? Because there's not one mill that fits all and I'll address that a little bit more later. But always you have to look at the context, the mission, the broader mission, and what does internationalization mean. Does it mean something different in this university than in Boston College because of its Catholic identity versus the public context? We, have, we don't know very much about it, and it's very important to understand how the context defines the strategies that you are developing for uh, internationalization. So, and there are several other examples of how we do our research on that. 
So that gives you an idea about how the center operates and how you can be international with very little means. I mean, my center is only me and my associate director and some graduate assistants, but by the partnerships all over the world, we are able to accomplish quite a lot together and make it really a kind of international approach. So that's a little bit about my center. If we talk about internationalization of higher education, we always have to put it in context what is happening in higher education and what is happening in the world. Because internationalization is only one phenomenon and not an isolated phenomenon of what is happening in higher education. And I cannot go into detail in all aspects, but I give you some ideas about how that relates to <coughs> when you talk about the current global higher education context. On the one hand, we see an still an increasing <coughs> massification of higher education. There are still around the world, in particular in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, uh, some parts of uh, Central Eastern Europe, a higher demand for higher education than there is a supply for higher education. There's still a need much more for uh, students coming from lower class and middle classes, uh, coming from primary and secondary education to go into higher education than there is supply. And that has an impact not only on private education, and come back to that but also on internationalization because many of those students look for opportunities to study in another country by the lack of quality educa higher education in other countries. At the same time, in Europe, uh, Western Europe, in Australia, Japan, the United States, uh, there is an oversupply of high internal demand from higher education from the more parts of the world. And that results in the fact that we are much more now competing for international students uh, and, as I come back later, the change in political climate might have a negative impact on that in countries like the UK and the United States. But it is a fact that currently nearly 5 million students are studying in another institution than their own country's institutions. And that's a double than 10 years ago, and the predictions are that it will double again in the next 10 years. So, there will be still an enormous flow of students going around the world to look for uh, quality higher education, and that has impacts on the way universities will operate. Uh, so that's one relationship. Massification creates increasing international mobility of students. Privatization is happening elsewhere, uh, everywhere, but in particular in the emerging and developing countries. And the supply of education is not coming from the public sector, but it's coming from the private sector. And you see an increasing number of private universities, and most of those private university countries are for-profit higher education institutions, where in the past we always had also uh, private universities, but they were mainly not for profit and mission-oriented. Uh, now the growing uh, uh, supply of private education is for-profit, and also that has an implication on the way we internationalize, because they will look for students, they will look for professors internationally, uh, and they will try to compete at the, in general at the lower end of the higher education market uh, in, in the world. And already in uh, Latin America, uh, more than 50% of the student body and more than 50% of the number of institutions are private universities. And we see similar trends in Asia, and we see increasingly similar trends in Central Eastern Europe, and also in, uh, in Africa. And uh, we still know very little about that, uh, and we uh, try to do more research. Uh, for instance, we are starting now a research project on family-owned universities around the world. But many of those new private for-profit uh, universities are family-owned universities, uh, like family businesses. What, what does it mean? What are the challenges related to that? So that's another aspect. At the same time, of course, we see that privatization is also happening in the public sector because increasingly the funding by the, the public sector to public universities has decreased. As you also notice here, uh, uh, we uh, see that in the United States, but we see that also elsewhere. And by that, the universities have to diversify their funding. And one of the ways they try to diversify is funding by recruiting international students as an income source. So that also is a relationship. We see the diversification, differentiation of higher education, not only in the sense of public and private, but also 
that there is a need for much more different types of universities around the world, different types of post-secondary education. Uh, we not only need world-class universities uh, like uh, Harvard, Yale, uh, and some others around the world, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, and uh, but we need national research universities, we need uh, from teaching institutions and flagship universities, we need uh, more uh, universities of applied sciences, we need more vocational post-secondary education. That differentiation is very important and that also implies the role of internationalization by type of university, if you are a world-class university, is completely different than we talk about a teaching institution or a vocational institution. So that we also have to understand and we have, and it's very important for higher education systems to be as differentiated as much as possible. Because society needs not only the top scholars, but also the good for the professionals and good vocational people. That's one of the big challenges that we see in developing in emerging countries is the trend is still to create universities and assume that they are research universities where in reality are not having that quality but also are not catering the needs for good professionals and good vocational uh, uh, people. The academic profession uh, in countries like the United States, most of the faculty are uh, PhD, uh, not nearly 100%. Uh, in many other countries, uh, they have masters, but the large majority of professors still in the world are only have a maximum of a bachelor degree. And that creates all kinds of challenges again for internationalization because it means that many countries set up scholarships like uh, Brazil, Chile, uh, Saudi Arabia, etc., to send their faculty with a bachelor degree abroad to get a master or a PhD. And that creates uh, another flow of uh, international uh, mobility uh, to happen. Uh, at the same time, if we continue to have an academic profession mainly based on uh, bachelors in the developing uh, world, that means the gap between the developed world and the developing world will increase. And if, that, if you see the massification taking place and not having sufficient people with a master and PhD, then that whole private sector will be of very poor quality in the future. So that's another challenge that you have to deal with. Academic freedom is a big challenge increasingly around the world. Uh, and we know that high quality, high education can only survive with good academic freedom for scholars to operate in. But academic freedom is another challenge in many developing and emerging countries. Have uh, clear examples: China, Russia, uh, but increasingly also elsewhere. And we see also some signs of uh, threatening of academic freedom even in the developed world. So that's a very concerning challenge that we have. Uh, reputation, rankings, uh, excellence are becoming much more a driving agenda for national governments and institutions of higher education. Uh, we want to be world-class universities, we want to be high in the national and international rankings. Uh, we want, uh, as governments, we want to have our universities compete, so they create all kinds of excellence programs. Uh, you see that in Germany, in France, in Russia, in Japan, in Korea. Uh, the lower investment in a small number of universities to be able to compete with the top universities in the rankings. In itself, that might have a certain impact on the quality of those top institutions, but it also has a danger that other universities stay at a lower level of quality because they don't get enough incentives to operate. And uh, university leaders around the world are increasingly fascinated by rankings, uh, and all their policies are focused on can we uh, uh, high up in the rankings. But the reality, of course, is there are only a few places in the top. Or top, even top 200, and uh, the ones that are in those top 100 or top 100 are much more easier to stay there because they have all the benefits already that they have a reputation, and that means that international scholars and international students and funding goes there. So it is very unlikely that there's much movement going on. And although we see a slight increase of the presence of Asian, in particular Chinese the universities and the universities in Singapore in the world rankings. Uh, that growth has still be very slow and still for a long time the top ranked institutions from the United States, United Kingdom, Europe, 
Australia, Canada, etc., don't maintain the high position in the rankings. Access to equity uh, is an issue that everywhere is concerned. We see uh, still everywhere in the world that access is mainly by the higher middle class and the upper uh, class into higher education. Uh, and there is uh, a lot of concern about it. There's a lot of debate about tuition fees. Uh, we have seen that in the presidential campaign with Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton make Clinton making an appeal for more uh, lower tuition, even free tuition. Uh, we see the same movements in Chile, we see it in South Africa, we see it in, uh, in the Philippines, uh, Ecuador, uh, where governments, in particular also the nationalist populist governments say, well, we have to make higher education tuition free to have the lower classes enter into higher education. Unfortunately, the reality is it's not going to work like that. Because you cannot see tuition as an isolated aspect. We know even from countries like uh, Brazil uh, that uh, it's in particular the upper class that gets into the public universities where there's no tuition fee because they have a good primary and secondary education, they have a culture in their families, etc. Uh, they are able to pass in the entrance exams, uh, that they go to the public universities and the lower middle class go to the private universities to pay tuition. And that's a concern that you see everywhere. Uh, so access and equity is still a concern we have to deal with. And of course, the current global uh, political climate has serious implications on internationalization. We see not only in the United States, uh, uh, in uh, the United Kingdom with the Brexit, uh, the, the election results, although as I said, positive uh, relatively in France and countries like the Netherlands, uh, but everywhere we see an increasing nationalist populist anti-globalization, anti-internationalization, anti-immigration trend. Poland, Hungary, the Philippines, even China, India, Russia, uh, basically what you see is a very nationalist populist development uh, and that has a serious impact on the way we uh, are operating as higher education, uh, high education institutions in the world. Because on the one hand, it limits immigration of international students, where on the other hand, many of the economies need those international students because of demographic reasons and the lack of uh, sufficient quality uh, of uh, students in their own countries for the STEM fields in particular. So there is a challenge that really has, uh, we have to deal with. And we have, uh, I'll come back to that, that we have to really address those issues in a serious way. If we talk about internationalization of higher education, we first of all have to remind us that it is a very recent phenomenon. We always talk about universities have to be international uh, uh, by nature, by its name already being universe, and by uh, remembering the Renaissance and the Middle Ages periods in Europe where you had the wandering students and wandering scholars which went from one university in the UK to Paris to Coimbra to Bologna uh, to study and to teach uh, and there was one common language like we have increased now in English uh, that was Latin uh, but the reality is that was only a very small group of universities and the very large majority of universities have been basically created in the 18th and 19th century uh, with a very national uh, approach to nation building and not with a very international uh, focus. It's only since the end of the Cold War uh, that we see that universities have been starting to drive much more international agenda, become much more uh, thinking about the strategic role in, in international higher education. Uh, so it is still a very relatively uh, young phenomenon. And at the same time, as I will discuss, it's a very broad phenomenon because it has many different components. It has mobility, it has curriculum, it has teaching and learning, it has branch campuses, branch operations, credentials, qualifications, etc. So it's a very broad and at the same time a very young phenomenon. It's driven by all kinds of different rationales. Uh, there might be political rationales to internationalize, uh, which was very strong after the Second World War, for instance, where universities were 
internationalizing to really try to create peace and mutual understanding in the world. It's driven by economic rationales and to create an international poverty competent labor force or just to make money at as many universities and governments see. And Australia uh, internationalization is the second export product uh, of uh, the country uh, because of the number of international students that pay high tuition fees and living expenses in the country. But that might be another reason. It is social and cultural, and uh, the whole study abroad is very social and cultural, creating a kind of personal development of the student uh, by going abroad, uh, very much driving force in the US internationalization strategy. Uh, and it might be academic, uh, increasing your reputation in research and in teaching, uh, and quality assurance that it might be the driving force. So you, you have always to ask yourself, and I come back to it, why are we internationalizing? It is having a different impact around the world. So internationalization means something completely different in the United States than it means in a country like the Netherlands. It means something completely different in Chile than it means in Colombia. It means something completely different in China than it means in India. Because the context of the country is very important, the political context, the economic context, the strategy for higher education is different. But it's also different, as I said before, between Harvard and a UPU. Uh, it's completely different than between the University of Amsterdam, where I have been vice president for several years, and the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, where I was a professor of internationalization, because it's a different type of university, and that implies that it didn't come. So it's very different even by disciplines. Internationalization means something completely different for biology than it means for business or for engineering or for education. And so it's very important to keep in mind that it's not one model that fits all. You always have to look at why and the context uh, we do internationalization. Uh, and that is, should be much more driving to agenda for what are you going to do. What are some of the main trends that we see when we talk about internationalization around the world? And this is based on a study I was leading for the European Parliament. Uh, two years ago, uh, I wanted to know, we are confronted with all of this kind of projects by the European Commission, like the Erasmus Student Mobility, the Horizon 2020 Research Collaboration, etc. And we, have, we don't know what internationalization means and what is the current state for it. So can you do with it? And then with a group of <coughs> colleagues, can you look into that and uh, give us an overview of what are the trends? And what we saw all over the world is that there is all levels of increasing importance of internationalization. And not only at institutions of higher education, but increasingly also uh, governments are having an international strategy, and Canada, Denmark, uh, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, Colombia, all over the world, you see that governments now say, well, we have to internationalize higher education. Uh, business community is increasingly important to understanding what uh, the importance of having people with uh, global competency uh, to work in their mind. So they are very important. Uh, local governments see it as an opportunity and a challenge for them to compete. Uh, so internationalization is really a phenomenon that is now on the agenda of all main stakeholders around the world. We see still an increasing trend to privatization and revenue generation. So uh, more and more universities and governments see uh, international students in particular as a source of income uh, and uh, that applies also to the United States where many uh, universities see the international students as the, uh, the compensation uh, for the decreasing uh, local student mo uh, movement but also <coughs> compensation for lack of federal and national and state funding uh, and a recent study has been showing that many of the public universities have uh, seen international students in conversation for public funding uh, and have been able to do that and that's one of the risks with the current political climate that in particular the state universities will lose that income source if the number of international students are not coming back to uh, the institution. So that's the challenge. We see increasingly competitive pressure by, uh, by global rankings uh, uh, which means that rankings have basically three indicators for internationalization. The number of international students, the number of international faculty, 
and the number of co-ordered publications, internationally co-ordered publications. And so many countries and many institutions only look at three, those three indicators when they talk about internationalization. They want to increase the number of international students, they want to increase the number of international scholars, and they want to increase the number of global publications. Forgetting that you can only do that when you have a comprehensive structure to receive those international students, when your own faculty are able to teach to a diverse international classroom uh, by having also the issues of uh, the language skills, etc., to, to do that. Uh, we at the center advise a lot the, the project 5100 in Russia. Uh, government of Putin has set 400 million a year, dollars a year to uh, upgrade 20 universities in Russia to be able in 2020 to come in the top 100 of the rankings. We always say that's not going to happen. But still we think that the money invested in the universities could be good. But then if we talk with them, they say, okay, what does it mean? We have to recruit more international students. Uh, and we have to have more international faculty. But good quality international faculty are not coming to Vladivostok. You would not go to Vladivostok, mm -hmm. most likely because of the climate and other reasons. Uh, so very unlikely, the same with international students. And if the international students come, they are mainly coming from the former Soviet Union, uh, and they're not always the best quality students, so it doesn't help them. So it's a very limited approach. You first have to create an overall basis of your quality in your institutions to be able to be internationalizing. And we don't see that only in Russia, we see that in many other countries. Uh, this kind of limited approach focused by rankings. We see increasingly more competition, and we compete for everything. In the past, we did mainly focus on collaboration, we go over, we exchange students, we exchange scholars, we did research cooperation. Uh, we still do the last, uh, but now we compete for students, we compete for scholars, we compete for research funding. That's a very broad trend around the world. We see some trend of regionalization. Uh, uh, the European uh, programs, the Bologna process, uh, have been a very important example of that. If you really want to create a kind of competitive environment, you have to work as countries together. And you see now that that process is also happening in ASEAN uh, countries. Uh, they are working together to set up joint uh, mobility schemes, joint research programs, uh, 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 recognition of credits, recognition of diplomas, etc. We see similar trends in Africa and in Latin America, uh, although the last part is more complicated than in the other uh, regions. But there is a trend to some regionalization, and we see numbers rising. As you we see numbers rising of international students, we see numbers rising of international scholars, we see the number of uh, partnerships uh, that are uh, signed, we see the number of uh, 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 programs taught in English to be competitive uh, rising, but there is a lack of focus on quality. It's not always good to have so many international students. In particular, as we have seen recently, that they mainly come from China, India, and uh, to a lesser extent, Korea. Uh, because if you have a big group of one or two countries in addition to your local students, uh, that does not really help to integrate them, does not help really to diversify the quality of your teaching and learning. It also makes you very dependent because if there is a crisis in China or in India, uh, the ruble is uh, going to be changing, then it really has an enormous uh, risk for you. So, uh, all this kind of focusing on numbers and not looking at quality <coughs> is really a danger everywhere around the world with internationalization. And what we see uh, is an increasing need. And also the development of what uh, my colleague and I, uh, of the Jones uh, uh, from the UK, have called the globalization of internationalization. Where in the past, internationalization was basically a Western concept. Yeah? United States, Australia, Canada, uh, Western Europe, and now has spread all over the world. Uh, uh, this is a book, and it is uh, available at the bookstore, and I have to give a little bit of for them, uh, so that they will sell copies for you. But uh, 
we, we wrote about it, and basically what uh, this is a quote from an article that of the journal. We see an increasing trend uh, that the concept of internationalization is becoming more global. We see more and more initiatives coming from Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, of new ways of internationalization. And on the one hand, we see that mobility is changing, and I've called it in one of my works in the university world, an acceleration process, but it's changing political climate of something what already was happening. Increasingly, students also go to study within their region. So Latin American students go from Peru to Colombia, or from Chile to, uh, to Argentina. We see in China an increasing mobility uh, from students from Nepal, Myanmar, uh, Bangladesh, etc. to go to China and to, uh, to India and to Singapore and to Malaysia. Uh, we see a similar trend in Africa. So mobility within the region and even between those regions increasingly is happening. A lot of African students within the past didn't have the means to go to Europe and to the United States. Now they have all find opportunities to go to India, they will go to Malaysia, they will go to China. Uh, they also see that there's a much more welcoming environment there. Yeah? If you are a Muslim student, you don't want to go to the United States anymore or to France or the Netherlands. You want to go to a Muslim country. So you go to Malaysia. Malaysia is explicitly inviting them to come to get good quality education. So that trend is happening with students. Uh, it's happening with internationalization at home. We see all kinds of universities around the world, Colombia, in Africa, in, in Ghana, etc. They try to develop their own model of internationalization and not just simply copying. We see even increasingly, actually next week a blog by the young world, the world is writing about it, increasingly universities that have branch campuses from developing countries. So they have, uh, they are doing exactly what in the past was mainly the United Kingdom, United States, and Australia doing, they set up their own branch campuses. They are working much more expanding their globe. We will not always say that that's a good development because that's the mainly playing at the lower quality end of the scheme. But it is certainly true that internationalization has become a much more global uh, phenomenon. But if you look at the picture, what we still see is that international mobility of the particular students is driving the agenda of internationalization. And there is a short-term gain, mainly in many countries and many institutions, but there are also some interesting alternative uh, situations. Take, for instance, Germany. Germany is really advocating an increase of international students in their own country. But there's no tuition fees. Not for local students, not for international students. Although one state, Baden Württemberg, has announced that they will have a very small, modest international fee for international students as of next year. But so, why would Germany still want to have so many international students, which are basically at the expense of the taxpayers? They have two main reasons. One is they want really to have those international students as ambassadors for their future cooperation. When they go back to their country, they will be ambassadors in the political sense, they will be ambassadors in the economic sense, so it's a long-term economic gain to do that. And the second reason is they need international students in certain fields because they have a local lack of uh, uh, supply. Uh, in the health sector and the STEM fields, uh, there is a shortage of, internet, uh, of, of local students because local students but the demographic reasons are decreasing, but also they choose much more humanities and social sciences. And so what they do, they say, well, you can come to study and you can stay uh, to work with us. That's a trend uh, which we see more elsewhere happening as well. Uh, but it's a different approach, which you also see in some of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, uh, but the trend in general is still for more short-term economic gain. Talent recruitment, uh, that's what I mentioned. Uh, uh, in the German case, you see everywhere that countries are saying, well, we don't need immigrants without education. That was something of the past. That was something uh, when uh, we had an industry uh, where our local people didn't want to work anymore, so we needed immigrants from uh, 
Africa, with the Caribbean, etc., Latin America, to work in our fields and in our industry. That's the same past, uh, but uh, what we need, we need skilled immigrants. We need people with higher education. And the best way to do that is to recruit international students in your institution, and then they come and stay and work. So Canada, Australia, uh, Japan, uh, uh, in the United States is a much more difficult political debate, but also if you see in the, in the Senate and Congress a uh, lot of discussion about that. Can we differentiate that people with high skills can stay and work where we don't want to yeah, be? That's also part of the whole change in political climate that is happening. So talent recruitment is a very important part. Rankings and international position is driving the agenda. But what we don't see very much is a comp comprehensive approach, where we also include internationalization of the curriculum, uh, teaching and learning internationalized. That's still very low on the agenda. And if it is on the agenda, it's basically in words, but not in practice. So that's the biggest challenge that we uh, face. And what of the reasons I think that's the case is because we still see internationalization as a goal in itself. Well, in my view, internationalization is only a means to increase the quality of what we are doing. So it's an instrument to help improve the quality of our teaching, improve the quality of our research, improve the quality of our service to society. That should be driving the agenda. And that's what comprehensive internationalization is all about, to make it really better. In the United States, something like 10%. So what about the other 90%? Uh, we don't deal with it. What about the faculty? Very few go abroad. Uh, we have to deal with them. So it's very important to keep in mind that internationalization is mainly important because it enhances the quality of what we're doing. And then, uh, Dylan has already mentioned that this is basically what we mean when we talk about comprehensive internationalization. In my view, internationalization is comprehensive or it is not. But if it's not comprehensive, then it is an international activity. And then it is study abroad or recruiting international students or daily curriculum. But really, internationalization is a process which by nature has to be comprehensive. But it was very important that the American Council of Education and NASA have been addressing that it is important to see that action point to really make it comprehensive. So that's why it is a good sign to use it, but basically it is an emphasis on what internationalization is about. And if we talk about strategies, there are in essence four things that we have to answer. Why are we doing it? What are we doing? How are we doing it? And what is the impact of what we are doing? That is very simple what internationalization is. The reality is that most of the strategies are only focusing on the what and the how. Yeah. The president says well, <coughs> or the vice provost says well, or the dean says well, Everybody is internationalizing, so we should probably do that as well. So let's set up a study abroad program. Well, let's we start to recruit international students. And to do that, we set up an international office or some other infrastructure, and we go to do that. Not thinking about why in our context we have to do that. What does it mean to answer that question in IUPI in comparison to Boston College? And why would you do that? What is your mission? What is your overall mission of the institution? And how does international fit into that? And I've seen around the world, and I've been reviewing and advising universities all over the world uh, about the internationalization strategy. And then they have an internationalization strategy, and they have another strategy, and there's no alignment between them. That's not possible. Then you don't increase the quality that you do just because you want to have numbers, or you want to have uh, uh, anything else. I don't know what, but it's, it's happening a lot. And only if you answer also the question why, you know what you want to get out of it. What is the impact of what you do? What are the outcomes of your strategy of what and how in relation to that answer of the why? 
So you have to see adapt all privacy together. And this is where we know what I call the comprehensive international safety circle. And I developed that already in the 1990s with my colleague Jay Knight of the uh, University of Toronto uh, when we were advising the OECD on internationalization. At that time, it was still not very clear to people, but uh, I still think this is how you have to look at what an international strategy and institution is. You have to start with an analysis of the context, but that gives you the answer to the question, why are we doing this? You have to be creating awareness. You have to have the stakeholders in the institution aware of it. So faculty, students, administrators, your, uh, your board of trustees, your, uh, your external uh, context, of the need and the purpose. Then you have to create a commitment by everyone, not only by the senior administration, but by the deans, by the board of governors, by the faculty, by the staff and the students to make the internationalization process going. And only then you can be doing planning and what are the needs, what are the objectives, etc. You can that's, that's, what are you going to do, then you do the how, and then you're going to implement. And you always have to review, you always have to see, is the context changing? Is the commitment changing? You have a change of uh, leadership in the institution that might have an impact. Uh, if uh, there is a difference between uh, Obama and, uh, and Donald Trump, then it has an impact on your strategy. So you always have to look about it. And then, based on that, you can reinforce your strategy. So it's an ongoing process of what you have to do in the institution. And you always have to look at the center. How does it contribute to the quality of teaching, research, and service to society? Because that's exactly what the purpose is, to increase the quality. So in all those aspects, you say, well, if we have an analysis, how can we, with an analysis, the quality of what we're doing. If we have a plan, how can we do it? That's the whole process. The reality is that most strategies are only focusing on a little bit of commitment by the, the, the president and the leadership of the institution, then start to plan and to operationalize and to implement, and even the review is not happening only in four or five years. That's not really a comprehensive strategy. So you really have to take that. If we talk about the what, there are basically two components, although they are very much related. One is the internationalization abroad, and the other one is the internationalization at home. The abroad side is all the mobility aspect. Mobility students, mobility faculty, uh, degree mobility is that you a full degree and credit mobility is part of your home degree, uh, uh, language courses, etc., uh, staff mobility, both with administrators and faculty, uh, program mobility, that's the branch campuses, branch staff operations. That's the whole abroad side. The internationalization at home is creating a campus internationalization, internationalization curriculum, teaching and learning, developing a joint programs, international intercultural learning outcomes and competencies. That's the The reality is, again, most of the strategies focus only on the abroad side and not at the home. And the irony is, again, that 90% of the students and the faculty are not part of the program. So if you internationalize, you leave out 90% of your stakeholders in the institution. That's why it's so important to focus on the internationalization of This is a definition by uh, Los Balen and Oscar Jones, uh, two experts on internationalization at home who say internationalization at home is the purposeful integration of international and intercultural dimensions into the formal and informal curriculum for all students within domestic learning environment. So it's integrating the international and intercultural dimension. It's not how the might be done. It is in the formal curriculum, that's the curriculum that you have in the syllabus, in the course outlines, etc., but also the informal curriculum, everything that's taken place outside the curriculum in the international campus. Uh, can be uh, film festivals, uh, all kinds
kind of activities that you do in an international context to make the campus much more internationalized. And it has to be for all students, so not only for the global ones. And the internationalization at home uh, as a concept was developed in, uh, in around 2000 in Europe uh, because people said, well, all the Erasmus programs, etc., are created basically at that time 5%, now we are close to 20% of the students to go abroad. But what about the other 95 to 80%? It doesn't go abroad, we have to pay much more attention to that. And that has been the best around the world that kind of move uh, to make much more emphasis on that aspect. International safety curriculum is a definition by Patrick Liss uh, from Australia, uh, a leading expert on internationalization of the curriculum. And he says internationalization of the curriculum is the process of incorporating international, intercultural, and global dimensions into the content of the curriculum as well as the learning outcomes, assessment tasks, teaching methods, and support services of the program of study. So it's important to say that the nationalization of the curriculum is not only we have to change the content. We also have to look at what does it mean in the sense of what international learning outcomes there are. How do we assess the learning outcomes? How do we teach the internationalized curriculum? And what kind of support service do we have for our students and for faculty to make the internationalization of the possible? So it's a comprehensive aspect. It's not only something like we have to look at the curriculum and say, well, we should address more issues from an international component. That's also very important <coughs> that uh, we have to do that, but it has a much broader scope of activities that you have to relate to them. And again, as I said in the beginning, it's very important that faculty have the ownership of that process. That is not something that's done from an administration, but that's really the faculty that are leading the process to international security. Because otherwise, you get skepticism. And people say, well, I'll do it already. And we have been seeing, we have been doing a lot of projects on internationalization of the curriculum in different parts of the world, and they all say that, oh, uh, we do that already, so we don't have to worry. And they don't, uh, or they say, we don't do it because it's an ethical task. And we don't want, we have already so much on our plate, we don't want to do it. If you create ownership in which they work together as a team to say, well, what do we have already in the region that's internationalized? And you will find out that already a lot is happening, but it was never explicit. And then what are we missing? What could we add? What could we change? Uh, and what do we kind of support this? How do we define the learning outcomes also from an international aspect? If the faculty do that together and ask opinion of the, the alumni, ask opinions of the students, ask the opinion of, of, of the, the people where they are, they're going to work, then really you create a kind of uh, more uh, system where it's possible to change the curriculum to make it much more international. And then we use a lot of the term global citizenship. Uh, global citizenship is very easily used and uh, many mission statements you say, well, we, we as universities want to create a global citizenship. First of all, that term is now very much on the debate of the current say, uh, political climate, uh, even Donald Trump and Theresa May uh, ignore that there are global citizens, uh, citizens there are only global citizens. Uh, and there is a certain truth in the sense that you have what uh, the British Journal, the Journal of David Goodman says, you have the anywheres that are the global ones, and the somewheres which are the local ones. Uh, but uh, there is an importance to make it understand that even if you are local, you have always to deal with the global dimension. And if you are global, you have to understand the local context and the local uh, implications. That doesn't mean that everybody in the curriculum has to be a future uh, uh, CEO of a multinational company or has to be a diplomat. Uh, that's what some people aspire and you have to facilitate for those people who want to do that by getting a special program. But you have to define <coughs> what are the minimum intercultural and international competencies and learning outcomes that students need even to work in a bank or a supermarket uh, around the corner here at the campus. Because 
clients will be much more diverse. Products will be much more diverse. You always have to deal as Gil yesterday evening said to me uh, that he is approached by many companies as well. We say, well, if I don't have an employee who doesn't understand about international and intercultural as a basis, then I cannot hire those people because we always have clients and products and so on. And that's the reality. So we have to define the minimum. We should not go for a maximum, but define what is the minimum that students need and make that happen in our curriculum. That's very important. And then you create global citizens in the sense of that they understand that they are living and working in a global environment as professionals and also as citizens. That they understand that climate change is not something that happens in China but also in the United States. That global health is an issue that if a crisis like Ebola happens uh, in, in Africa that it really has an impact on the health situation here. And that you have to understand that and to, to make that happen. So, all those kind of issues, the sustainable development goals in the United Nations are some basis that the students understand that they are important to do. That's the uh, task. I'm going to end with the thing uh, with time. But this is what Betty Lisk and I in the World Report of Pune in Barcelona in 2016 wrote about the relation between global and local. Uh, the higher education institutions have an important role to play in ensuring a sustainable future for the world by also meeting the obligations to the local communities. Don't <coughs> see it as two differences. They are interconnected. Uh, develop responsible global citizenship to understand the relationship between the local and global and are committed to a new pathway for human development and well-being as we prepare them to live as responsible social, economic and human beings. For that support, we will broaden the knowledge base of the curriculum, and we want the European canon and Western level to use in developing in students the skills, knowledge, and attitudes associated with responsible global citizenship. That's a very important task that we have to do. And that's, we have to do it in a realistic way, and we have to understand also what happens in the world, what happens in the world in the end, and why are those people focusing on each other? Why are uh, they thinking that uh, global is wrong. Why are we having to uh, to also accommodate their understanding and then make them help them? It's not simple uh, black and white, it's much more complicated. I'm going to end with the meaning uh, of internationalization. This was a definition I read J9 in the 90s and later we at the beginning of 2002 uh, defined what is internationalization. The process of integrating international, intercultural, global dimension into the purpose, functions, and delivery of post secondary education. That was a definition which is quite broadly accepted around the world. Uh, but when we did the European Parliament study, we said, well, but if you look at the future, is this definition enough? Because it basically says we have to internationalize. And uh, that's not enough to, to in, in the current political environment that we are facing. So we said, if we want to have a new definition, building on that J9, it has to be much more inclusive and less elitist. So it not has to only focus on the Western concepts, but it has to be global. It has to be not only focused on the small centers of faculty and students that go abroad, but it has all students. Uh, if we do a whole mobility still is a very important and valuable part of internationalization. Nothing against mobility on the contrary, as much as possible you should stimulate it. But if we do it, don't see it as something nice uh, the student has a nice personal experience, which is also important. They need to have a good personal experience. But make it part of the group. So integrate it into the group and make it an integrated part. And re emphasize that internationalization is not a goal itself, but improve the quality, and it's not only driven by uh, economic uh, rationales. And as a result of that, we came to the following extension of the definition. Uh, and the blue one gives the extension. It is a process, but it is an intentional process. It's 
not something that happens automatically. We really have to make it happen. That's very important. And it has to be in order to enhance the quality of education and research. And so, make it clear, it's not a goal in itself. And it has to be for all students and staff. So, emphasize the importance of internationalization as well. And to make a meaningful contribution to society, global citizenship focus. We think that's, in essence, the agenda for the future. And uh, with that given time, I think I uh, could add more, but that's almost the case. I have a tendency to talk too much, so uh, thank you very much. And happy to answer the question, but I think that's more at the end, but if it's space now, at the end. At the end of the lunchtime, there will be a Thank you very much.